Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's great to see you here. I'm Mike, one of the co-founders here at Waybook, and today on the Smooth Scaling webinar, we're going to be talking about one of those topics that we often don't enter into the front of our mind until it's essential, and then we never want to forget it. Because as founders and operators, we're always focused on growing our businesses, all of the interest in scaling challenges, we don't always engage our brain with the challenging inflection points that will no doubt face us at some point in the future. This includes our team leaving, of course, and whether that be through downsizing or just general staff over, staff turnover, if we're not fully prepared, then that can present some real problems for us. So today I'm joined by business coach and systematization expert, Wendy, and we're gonna have a bit of a conversation. Firstly about Wendy and her career, because she spent a whole career mastering the art and the science of organizing businesses and improving business knowledge, building systems, building processes, and helping businesses scale. And I'm really excited to dive into the knowledge of how we retain knowledge as our businesses grow and adjust. So, Wendy, hello, how are you? Hello, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Good stuff. Thanks so much for joining. Um, for those of you who are tapping in from different parts of the world or watching this on replay, I'm very much at the beginning of my day here in London. And Wendy, what time is it with you at the moment? 6pm, Brisbane. Okay, cool. Yeah. And where, whereabouts are you calling from today, Wendy? Calling from today, Brisbane, the Sunshine State. Australia. Yeah. Nice. So you're not just on the other side of the day, it's the other side of the world and yep. also the other side of the seasons as well. I feel like our temperatures are probably yes. quite different today. Absolutely. Yes. The air con's on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Very cool. Well, it feels like I've got air con on, but it's just because it's minus three outside, but there's no <laughs> complaint. So Wendy, thanks so much for joining us today. I know we've had a couple of conversations before and I've just been totally fascinated by, by your perspective on scaling and systematizing, which I know you've done so much. Obviously today we're talking about knowledge retention. So we'll jump mm. into who you are and what you do, but what, firstly, what do we mean when we say knowledge retention? Yeah, it's that knowledge that we have in our heads or the heads of other people. And it's really about capturing and retaining the critical institutional knowledge or subject expert that you have in your business. And so a lot of your people might have been there a long time, so they're retaining that information. And that's what it's all about. It's keeping that in the business because that's critical to how the business operates. And so at any point, anybody could leave that's been a long time in your business. You might think they're never going to leave me, but Ultimately, that's going to happen at some point. And that's when and it happens too often. That's when that knowledge can leave. Or it could be just a scramble to actually realize at that point that what happens when this person leaves. And um, so it's really about putting that plan together so that when that inevitably will happen at some point, that you don't panic. You, you don't go into reaction mode. You've actually got a plan to retain that information and share it with the rest of the team. Because without that knowledge, if, excuse me, you're going to find that there's your team are going to possibly make up their own processes and before you know it you're going to have a lot of inconsistent results yeah I, this makes a lot of sense what well, before we dive in you've worked mm. with many businesses of all different shapes and sizes how prepared are businesses generally for this generally not prepared so when that time comes that's what i mean that's when that feeling comes oh what are we going to do okay and often they'll give a couple of weeks notice but these days, that's about it. You're lucky if you get longer notice. And so that's not a lot of time to be prepared. You often might find that as well, that person isn't because they're leaving, there's got there's a lot to do. And so you might not have time to actually capture that. We've actually had the calls from clients that say, they're panicking, I've got somebody leaving, can you help us to capture that knowledge. And so rather than being in that position, that's what you want to have a plan to do. So you are prepared for that as best you can. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, um, we've also worked with a few clients. I was mentioning to you before we mm. jumped into this call, actually. And uh, and yeah, sometimes, a lot of the time, it is about systematizing and actually getting ahead of it. But we have also had those clients that are like, our ops manager or our ops director is leaving yep. next week. Help. <laughs> what do we do? And I think it's because sometimes when we're so focused on scaling, we don't always think about actually half a step backwards, which can sometimes feel, it can sometimes feel like when people move. And I think there is also this human nature side, right? That, that, when somebody is in their last two, three weeks, even if they deeply care about the business and the team, there is a part of them that has 
I don't want to say mentally checked out, thinking about their next step. They're thinking about perhaps some time off or the next challenge and things like that. So yes, let's dive in. Yes. What can we do? What, <laughs> how can we make sure that we don't face these challenges and lose this knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of things we can do. I've tried to break it down into some sort of simple steps. So I think, first of all, just before we jump into that, is to really talk about the importance of it. And what's at stake if you don't have this? Yeah, I'm going to give you a four-step plan. But first of all, before you get to that point, it's having that having a strategy, a plan in place, or whatever, you know, a process, I like to call it, of knowing what needs to be done, not at the time somebody leaves, but building up to that all the time, basically. So what we've got to start to think about first is to do this sort of audit, to think about there's people in the business that have got this knowledge. And whether you're a small business or a large business, there's, you're going to have what we call key person dependency. And that is when you've got a heavy reliance on a key person or a key team member that has that knowledge. And it could be that's their role, but it also could be, say, a, for example, a project that's maybe a recent project that person's been working on and they haven't had a chance to share that information. So the I suppose the importance of it is that if that goes out the door when they leave is how do we then, it's going to take us a long time and somebody new coming in isn't going to have anything to base that on. And so they're going to start from scratch and before you know it and you're going to ask somebody else and you've got all these consistent, inconsistent results. So the importance of it is obviously it's a time saver. It's going to give that new person in that role, they're going to be able to replace that person. We're not talking about they're going to know everything about you, but then let's talk about having those key responsibilities at least documented. The importance of that is that it's going to be a smooth transition into that new role. You're going to then be able to focus on that new person who's also going to continue to improve that process. And so it's about the, you know, what are the risks when, think about it, I think it's good to do that first audit to think about if John in sales or Sarah in accounting was to leave next week, what sort of situation am I going to be in? Am I going to be able to manage? Because also somebody could leave in a hurry as well. We've talked about maybe giving notice, but it's not always the case. And so we have to think about that as well. What sort of risk does that leave? So that's the importance of it is realizing what situation you're going to be in. It's again about saving time and training and not having to spend time going, really starting from scratch with that new person. So key things that we talk about when we talk about importance of doing it. So there's a lot of benefits because if people start to think that's going to be a lot of work to do, I always say this with systems and processes, it is a lot of work to do. But when you're in that situation, you're going to wish that you put the time in when you had the chance to put the time in because that is not the time as when someone leaves is to be scrambling like that. And it doesn't look great for the new person coming on board either. So yeah, they're the key points about making that really, making that an importance and a priority. So that's one of the key messages here is to, it's not a set, it's not a set and forget thing. We did it once. It's about building that into the way you run your business. Like the, the culture of knowledge yeah. and communication. Because I think you're right yeah. in terms of this. I never like to overface myself or anyone being like, yes, it is a lot of work. But the compa- the comparative nature of it is it's a lot less work than not having it. And I love this point, yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot more about actually it becoming a cultural way of managing yes. knowledge communication because that almost means yeah. that instead of like having this mountain to climb of okay you're off mm. so let's get all of your information if it's just I, I, yes. I'm sure I'm diving into this but if it's just the way we'll we operate <laughs> and it works just, just just before we move on your point here about the key person dependency in theory is everybody a key person dependency of some sort or actually are there specific people and roles within businesses where this yeah. is some importance? Yeah, so this is one of the steps, actually, that is the first step, actually, is to identify what the knowledge is and who has it. So typically, the person or the key person who has that knowledge is typically someone who's been with the business a long time, maybe from the very beginning, maybe they've been there many years, and Uh they've just that institutional knowledge. Yeah, that's what they've gained over time. So very little of that is likely to be documented it's likely to be in their head so Mm. look for that person like I mentioned it could be a project manager who has been working solely on a project or knows the ins and outs of that project but it could also be someone in a quite a key role that is often like an integrator role that that sort of has that knowledge of everything if you like they're the person that a lot of people go to when they've got questions so you'll be able to recognize those people that have that knowledge and also doing that audit when you actually if you've got a reasonably small business with not too many employees it's not going to take you too long to actually go through all of those roles and ask that question so there's a lot of questions that you can be asking so one of them is 
what are the sorts of questions that other people go to or who do they go to for those sorts of answers? And that's going to be a key person. The other sort of questions yeah, you want to be asking is when a new person comes on board in a certain role, what are the key things they're going to know and who would be that person to? So if they go into a sales team, for example, who would be typically the person that would be training them? And so if you've got one person that does all the training, if that trainer leaves, yeah, other people can pick it up, but it's going to be quite hard. It's going to be a bit messy. So we want to look at the people that have got that knowledge and who have done that role before. So they tend to be in those sorts of positions. They could be an operations manager. They could be any role, really, but they're more central to the business. So they could also be a team leader, that sort of person. So the key is to identify what the knowledge is, and that's by asking those questions. And you'll know instinctively most of the time. And if you've got a bigger organization, then you need to go to your team leaders and ask them the same question and get them to answer it. Who in their team? are the key people that your department would be at risk if those people leave. So mm. that's how you identify who has the knowledge. And then the first, and the, along with that is what is the knowledge? Once you know who it is, what is the key knowledge? And here the key as well is to focus on the 80-20. So rather than thinking I've got to document it 100% of this person's role, if you just look at their key responsibilities, what are the five to seven things that person is responsible for? Often they'll do that whatever that role is day in and day out. So these are also, you want to document the things that are happening regularly, repeatedly in the business. And that's how you're going to identify the what. And so over time, you can document more of that. But if you're just starting out, let's get the core things that somebody else, if they were coming in as a replacement, what are those key things that they would need to know as, as far as processes or even when I say processes, it could be institutional knowledge is also, they could have a secret roller decks, for example. Like who are the contacts? Is that shareable? Have we, do we know this person? You find a lot of people have built over many years relationships with like their suppliers, for example. That's quite hard to capture that information, but there could be things like just a simple supplier list, handing over that sort of information. So identify the what and the who has the information. That's step one. And so, so whose responsibility is it generally to, to lead the charge within this? Obviously, where the knowledge is mm. and what the knowledge is is very dependent but is this kind of a founder role is this an ops role is this a hr role or does it is it, vary? it depends on the size of the business yeah uh -huh. so if you've got say 10 plus employees you're probably you may have an hr person who has that role or as you as your organization gets bigger you might have somebody in learning and development or in hr they would typically the person to oversee this type of to have this process going in the business where you are you are doing this knowledge retention if you're a smaller business are you going to look at your team leaders? So if you've got a foreman, a, a sort of a supervisor role, an ops manager role, a project manager, those sorts of roles. If you've got teams where you've got, yeah, head of sales, they would be the people to initiate it within their department. Okay. Now, there, there's a difference between the person who initiates this and drives it as opposed to the person who's going to capture the knowledge. And generally, the, what we call a process owner. So if it's a key person, it's often is that sort of leadership role, but it also could be somebody else of senior in the business. And so it makes sense to have that knowledge captured or whatever you want to call it, documented by the person, of course, that's doing that role. But there's mm -hmm. lots of different ways that we can capture it. And it could be a, it, they team up with somebody who actually helps them to document it. But the person who oversees it to make sure it actually happens should be the team leader of that department. Okay, and so explored this kind of difference between the thinking of it almost like the kind of tacit knowledge and the implicit knowledge. So in terms of mm. if I'm focusing on the five to seven things that I do all day, every day, that, that feels quite straightforward because I can just look at my calendar, I can just spend a week and just write down everything I've done in that week. Yes. Uh, do, do you have any kind of tips in terms of identifying what that implicit knowledge or that institutional knowledge may be? Because so, sometimes they're the elements that mm. we don't appreciate that we know because it's just part of who we are and how we operate. How do we tease that out? Yeah, yeah, good question. So I think to do that, like what you mentioned is to track that, what you're doing. I would say one of the basic things you need to have is a really good job description. That was like the basics or some sort of position agreement. So you actually know what the key responsibilities. You may even have KPIs that you know what their responsibilities are. So you've got resources there you can look at. And of course, the smaller the business, you're going to be more hands-on with that person. So you're going to know what it is. So if you haven't got that already, you need to come up with those. What are the things that they are ultimately 
uh, responsible for. That's more the high level things. And then what is the tactical thing? So that's the day to day. So that might be every Friday, I run a report. Every Monday, we do a team, a five minute stand up meeting might be how to run that sort of thing. So these are things that they do repeatedly. So you want to make sure that is recorded somewhere. And the best place to have that is some sort of position agreement or um, description so that everybody knows, even from the very beginning, it's very clear what their role is and what they're responsible for. So that's where you're going to find it. The other way is just to talk to your team and start to actually bring that out of them. And, and ask, or, or, like you said, ask them to write down just a simple spreadsheet or a piece of paper and say, what are the things that you do every day? What are the things that you do every week? What are the things you do every month? That's a good starting point to find that out. And you could even say, give them a scenario. So if you were bringing in someone in, into your department and to help you with your role, like we don't have to say, if you leave, we need this. You've got to be very, this is why we're going to talk about in a, mom, in a moment, how you bring this in to be something normal. So it's not just, oh, they're going to replace me. They're asking me to write down what I do and uh -huh. your team starts to get suspicious. So it's a gradual where we build that into our, our culture. But yes, talk to your team and ask them if we needed to hand over some of the things that you do, what would those key things be? Yeah, nice. so there's a few ways there that you can actually yeah peel that information out. Yeah, love it. So we've got some someone's running this as a as an operation or as a project. We've identified those key key knowledge dependencies. We've identified mm -hmm. processes, the activities, the other knowledge that's mm -hmm. necessary. What now? How, uh, I guess stage two is extracting. I'm sure there's a extract. More... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, capturing. I like to call it capturing because. If we say document, everybody associates, oh, that's me writing it in a document. And people say, I can't do documents or SOPs. It sounds like to me, every time I think of the SOP, I think of a very boring static document. So these days there's, yeah, there's lots of ways. We use multimedia to capture. And just to give you, I mean, this, yeah, this could be a whole webinar topic on its own, but some of the key things that you can do, especially if you want to speed this up a little bit, is to just to use the different types of media. So mm -hmm. One that we promote a lot is video. So when people think video, oh, I don't want to be on camera. It's most of video. If you think about what you do every day, if someone's doing a desk job, they're going to be doing, they're probably going to be spending most of their day on a computer. So then we've got videos, a screencasting that you can capture what you're doing. So you can do small videos to explain things. And again, if you've got time to do this, it's not like you don't have to do this in, the, in your last week. This is, can be done over time. And when you have a new process come up, you record a new video. If you need to update something, you record another video. So that's one way. The other types of video as well, are obviously you can do face to camera. The other types of video, workplace videos, which are really great, which often work good with work with two people. So someone's demonstrating something. So it might be how to use a piece of equipment, for example. So someone else is holding a phone and all you need, you don't need any special equipment. You just need to have a, a phone in your pocket, make sure the audio is good. That's about the best thing. And you haven't got too much background noise and just record that and just very short recordings. And other ways you can do it is get the camera out again in your pocket, take photographs of something. If you want to show how something should be a packaging label, for example, rather than trying to write it all out, you stick the label in the top left-hand corner and make sure it's close to the edge, just take a photo of it. So sometimes we don't think through, think things through, through. So there's lots of different ways we can do it. Maybe the CEO has a message that he wants to convey to people do it in audio or he wants to record a sales call with a potential client record sales script so there's so many ways that we can do things without having to use documents and if we do use documents think about having a checklist first starting off with an outline uh, and then building up over time and so if you've got those key steps down then you can go back and have a look at, oh, I've got five steps in my process. That might be five separate videos, for example. So then it makes it more manageable than thinking that you've got to sit there in front of a computer for hours and just try and think of all the things that you do. And, and again, speaking to that, having more time to do it, you can then, you don't have to do it in one sitting. You could say, I do, I do payroll every Friday. So maybe today in payroll, I'm going to just record or capture the first few steps. And then next week when I do payroll, I'll do step three and four. And again, so you can build that over time. So this is where we talk about it being natural thing that people do. It's not just, oh, it's a big, we've all got to scramble. It's a big, it's an incentive from the, uh, from the business owner. And then we all have to learn things really quickly. These are things that we um, need to have as part of our roles. And so going back to those position agreements, one of the things I always say is you must have in there that everybody, regardless of what their role is, responsible for their own processes. Mm -hmm. And that when I say responsible, that means not just carrying it out, but actually updating their, whatever you call it, operations manual playbook. That has to be everybody's responsibility, even if they're not the actual one 
recording or writing. Everyone needs to be involved. And so that should be built into their job description so that it's not a surprise later on if they're asked to document what they do and they just don't know what you're talking about. So this is something that they need to know from the very beginning. And the more obviously new people you bring in, they'll know no different. That will be the culture of the business because that's all they've ever known. We actually added that into all of our roles a few years ago. And actually, you're right. No, there, there was never there was no never question. any question yeah. about whether or not that was a good or bad thing to do. It was like, with, no, with, that, that's the way we do things here. And, yeah, absolutely. And, Interestingly, you you bring up the point, and I believe we're going to talk about normalizing this, but just tapping into that, this isn't, this is the value for the business is retaining the knowledge if people were to leave, but the actual value for the team and the operations is that your example of payroll, and I'm saying this with a lot of heart because I did exactly this. (laughs) When I used to run payroll, I used to do it in the different formats. It actually made me way more efficient at executing that process because it just meant I didn't have to re-engage the brain with those repetitive tasks. Is that, where does that live? I just literally clicked the link and I had five things that I knew I needed to do really easy, which then also made it easier for me to delegate that and move on. We've got this end goal in mind, but actually what you're talking about here has a whole wealth of value and benefits for everybody moving forward. Yeah. I just mentioned one thing I forgot actually what is one of those key benefits is actually an opportunity here if you haven't done it for a long time is to do that audit but to actually improve what you're doing so when you ask somebody to document payroll just make sure that they actually take a few minutes to actually because we do things all the time each day every day we don't really think about how we're doing it so when we stop for a few minutes and actually think and maybe we document it we look at that and go actually I think we could maybe not do step one or two or this has changed now or maybe there's a tool that could automate this part for me it actually makes you stop and think so you've actually got that process improvement in there as well if you take the time to do it rather than just doing a robotic thing about writing it actually look at it as well and make sure do it I, we use checklists to say this is an improvement checklist is it efficient just a simple question like that you heard of lean manufacturing and all those things is there waste involved is there something that's taking a long time or people get confused about that's actually your opportunity to fix it there and then so mm. you're not documenting something that is potentially broken yeah and, and then you've tested it out but also just think of when you do bring that new person on just think of, have about that delegation and train them how efficient is that going to be when you can say that there's a process here Follow that. And if you've still got questions, obviously, let's have a chat about it. But you don't have to sit there for the next 30 minutes explaining how to do payroll. They can look at it, learn from it, and then ask questions if they need to. And it's so hard when you're being onboarded to retain the pressure on the person training to make sure they Mm. see everything that, you know, everything they're possibly going to need and for the person being trained to retain everything at that point. A couple of things you said there just reminded me, the process optimization. And I think you're so right Mm. about saying capturing over documenting i think there's a lot of words within our space that sound Mm. way more boring than than what they are right so as i say process optimization we're basically talking about like making things easier and better and more efficient actually spoke with a a waybook customer literally last night and she was telling me that they have in their operation they have as a fundamental activity of all of their team to submit a document improvement every week. So every Friday, yes. her and her CEO literally yes. just review the change log of everybody in the team to say, okay, we've added in this video where we've changed this or we've removed that step. And what I found really interesting was that the position that she had taken was improve the documentation. It wasn't actually to improve the process, but she said mm. what she found by the focus on improving the documentation enabled people to have a really critical view on on the processes that they had because sometimes if we look at our workflows and we're like oh that's we do that that we do that because that's the way things are done but as soon as you almost extract oneself from that this is me and this is my work and we're saying this is the manual of my work it almost enables us to take a more more interesting view oh ownership is everything yes and also giving it actually empowers the team to actually say to them this is your process this is your mm-hmm. opportunity to help us improve a lot of people are like frightened to say something but if you're running that process day in day out and you're getting frustrated with something it doesn't make sense to keep quiet about it you need to be able to have that culture in the business that you can bring this up when it needs to be and you maybe you work as a team or you put a suggestion forward but you've always heard of the things don't bring me problems bring me solutions <laughs> I say that I find myself saying that a lot because if yeah, if you want to change it that sounds great what do you suggest and of course if you implement that then they're going to be more empowered so they've actually got something that that 
their role is now they can actually impact their own role and make mm-hmm. it better, and which makes their life better at the end of the day because they want to. Is, is how they're spending their time. With, exactly. Yeah. If they know that it impacts a client or a customer as well. That's even more reason to let's get this fixed. And so they're empowered to come up with those fixes and then go and document to make sure that somebody else does their job. Because also we talked about people leaving, but what about when they go on holiday? What, if, what, what do they take long service leave for a month? Someone's got to do that. And if they have got no way of really knowing what the best process is, mm-hmm. they're going to make it up. And so then you're going to get inconsistency and mistakes made with orders or clients or whatever it is. So that's important as well. So yeah, giving ownership to people is you own this. And people like to take that responsibility. Yeah. And, and then yes, this is your baby. You look after it. Yeah. I love that. It's such a strong point. J- just on a very practical note, you talk about completing payroll and we do step one, two, three today and then step five, four, five uh, the next day. Would you recommend that if someone's saying, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to capture everything in the business. Would you recommend that you first create the almost the structure and the empty titles for the processes you want to do? And then almost that's the list of things that you jump in and out of? Or can it be done more iteratively than that can people just jump in and do a process as they're doing it i would always recommend doing a plan first so you can keep track so again this should be an initiative by it's always better if you have somebody who's like running it think of it like it's not really a project because i say projects have an end date but this never has an end date but to initialize it let's call it a project to begin with you need somebody who's overseeing it you also need someone who's like i mentioned before driving it so whether you need to introduce if it's an existing team then you need to get them all on board. So you're going to have communication here. So somebody who's driving this initiative, who's communicating to why we're doing it, so important to talk about why we're doing this so they Mm. don't go, oh, here we go. I've already maximized my capacity and now they want me to document what I'm doing. You've got to be joking. So to avoid that, uh, you need that communication to say, explain why it's important. It makes their life easier, the business owner's life easier, the clients, everyone's happier. So that's really important is to get that going. And then it's a plan. So the, the next question your team are going to say, that, yeah, okay, great. I understand that. It's good. What do we do next? What's the plan? So that you need to have a plan. And it can be as simple as really just signing a spreadsheet and going back to those people and saying, what is that 80, 20? What are the core things that you do in the business? That's always a good place to start. And start if you start to write down everything, you said, let's systemize or document everything. I don't like the word everything because that will overwhelm people. Mm. Let's start with saying, what are your top five? What are the top 10 things that are most important? Yeah, mm-hmm. if, the, if with your role, what are the key things? What are you really here to do? What's your responsibility? And they go, let's just use the payroll again. If I don't do payroll on a Friday, people won't get paid. That's pretty important stuff to do. So that could be number one for the accounts person. That would be how to do payroll. And so come up with those key things. You can always add to it later on. But if you give them 100 processes to work through, they're just going to look at that list and it's never going to look at it. It's going to get through it. So give them something that's manageable because you can always add more and you can do little initiatives. You could do co-working sessions. There's so many different things you could do. You can have a little competition between your departments if you've got a big enough business to do that. The first team to document the first 10 things or whatever, there's so many things that you could do, but just start off with something that's manageable and preferably that they could actually get a win on so they could actually see in action we've actually documented this I was able to give it to the assistant or the new person and they followed it and it worked great and Mm -hmm. somebody could say that actually just saved me an hour of training so they can actually see that to give them a win and then that gives them that sort of motivation to keep going back to the question was that yeah about how to start is I would get a basic plan together and that could be a simple spreadsheet where you write down the roles and those key responsibilities next to it you might have a column that says do we have a document already or do we have something a resource on this whether it be a template or something yes or no if it's no there you go that's a task and so if you have a task manager of some sort a project management system then you can go in and assign it to someone to do yeah and then you just go through them like that some people might say well we've got documents but oh we just we haven't looked at them for five years they might be no good but they might be something you could start with something like that so it's basically that audit but you put it into a spreadsheet and then you manage that or you put it into a project management app Uh or whatever you're using and then you can manage the progress but I would I would put some sort of milestones along the way so it might be look we want to do two or three a month or whatever that is so people can actually see that because otherwise they'll just if you don't make it a priority 
Yeah, it won't be a priority for your team either. They'll go, oh yeah, I'll get to that when I've got time. Yeah. So this is probably one of the biggest problems I find that the teams have is that they go, there's very few people that are sitting around all day at a desk with nothing to do. They're like, well, how am I going to fit this in? But if it's important to do, then it's important to find the time. It's not, I don't have time. You have to make time like, for anything that's worthwhile. So giving them that, whether it's saying everyone on a Friday at three o'clock, phones down or whatever, hand, start doing it, whatever, or just to give them some time in the week that they can do that. So it's having a, so one thing is telling them what they need to do, but then it's actually allowing them to do that and giving them the resources. The thing with that plan is as well, the next question is going to be, okay, so now I know I've got what it is I'm documenting. I know when I have to do it by and how do I do it? And that's where you've got to then give them a process for creating the process. And that's where you need some resources around videos and all those different ways they can do it. And so that's where, because if they don't have the skills or the confidence to do it, mm. again, it will be pushed back because I didn't really know where to start. I've never documented anything before. And then again, we could go on for hours about this. But well, anyway. do you know what? I'm bubbling because you're saying so many things. Like We see this with everybody who we speak to with Waver. I think one of the... One of the core points, and you've definitely said this, I just want to hit it on yeah. its head, is this point that you've said about overwhelming people. So actually starting with the top five or 10 documents and then making them do it. What we see so often with businesses that have decided that this is a priority, they say, okay, Wendy, you're in charge of creating our operations manual, our playbook, our SOP, whatever. Go forth and conquer. So actually, the output of a waybook, a playbook, whatever that may be, yeah. is the product. And you've just, yes. just played back that actually, even if we ask our team to document more than three or four things, it's going to, this might be overwhelming in the immediate term. For yeah. that individual, bearing in mind that might be the founder, that might be the ops manager, that might be the mm-hmm. OMT, mm-hmm. the whole playbook is almost paralyzing to consider. And I think that what we've seen that can often limit people from getting going on this is they take on that responsibility, that accountability, and they say, do you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make a start on this. So they then get lost in the detail. What we have seen, and I'm sure you've seen something similar, is this process of capturing and optimizing your knowledge is a really great way for us to be able to almost spot these gaps in Mm -hmm. expectation and execution within the team because most founders have done most of the roles in the business as the business has scaled and then as they've handed that knowledge and information over of course things iterate and change and grow so sometimes things are happening that that various different people don't really know about so actually it's better for the teams to document and it's better for people to do less in order to get further and then the two other points that just were bubbling in my mind this whole concept of what do I do and what does it look like we very much run on the principle of note for yourself and then edit for someone else and it was actually yes. brought by one of our by one of our senior developers Luke where he when we were going through this process he was like if we note for ourselves and edit for someone else it just enables us to get that knowledge out and then we yes. refine yes. and actually that stops this kind of blank page fear of okay what does this SOP need to look like or what does this video need to be or whatever it's let's get the knowledge out and then let's refine it to share it with other people yes absolutely so there's something you could give them a basic form that has got some key points that they fill in so it might be obviously what's the name you might not think that but that's actually quite important because that name we're going to be searching for later on when we share things and because we're not creating paper manuals here we're, we're we're talking about online manuals. So the name is actually really important. So things like that. So what is the name of the process? What is, why do we even do it? That's important to train a new person on. You could actually put down just a few key points on a form that they fill in to just get them started. And so that you've got, you start to create that consistency. And then it might be, who is the person that does this? That that helps as well, because even though, you know, it's yourself, if you put the role down again, that helps when it goes into an operations or training manual. That's mm-hmm. really important. So maybe those key things, you could also even just give them a st- what is the, what are the steps. You could actually get them to just write the checklist out first. So there's a lot of things you can do. And I've even got a form which actually has a tick box that says, is this process going to work better by video? Is it going to be best done in a checklist? Is it going to be best done by audio? So you, I can actually start to think that through, choose the best way to do it because we can put all of those elements together. I also think that's really important for adult learning as well. If you've got different variety rather than who wants to read under a page PDF of just black text on a white background, you you want to have 
a mixture of videos and images and things like that, because otherwise people are going to, when they start to learn it, they're just going to get so bored. If we get the result, that's the most important thing. So mm -hmm. you're going to have some people that are really whiz at videos and other people that just won't do it. And that's fine. If it has to be a video, then maybe you team people up. But yeah, giving them those skills. And so not, they can't turn around, well, I didn't do it because I hadn't got a clue what to do. So you give them, they make it as easy as possible. But pairing up is another really good thing because you could pair them up with, like you said, the knowledge worker and the person that can extract it. For example, if John in the warehouse doesn't really know how to write down or to really explain, that's not his skill, but he's really good. He can tell you all about it and how it's, then get someone to interview him that maybe still works in that department that's got some knowledge and go, okay, so tell me, what do you do? And then what do you do when after that? Okay. And you mentioned about that, but hang on a minute. If I was learning that, I wouldn't know where you put that because you didn't explain that part. That's all a question, questions and backwards and forwards. And yeah. then you could, like you said, get someone to edit it and then give it back to John. And John goes, yeah, that's it. Good. And you've got the process. And then because you've got probably is, one more is, layer. It's actually and, a different skill set, isn't it? This whole kind of... So, yeah, so, not so, everyone wants people to do have, it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have such a structured, process-driven mind. Yeah. I, I know you got into this world because you are great, very diligent and excited about organising things. You are obviously <laughs> born into the world of let's get everything organised and then Absolutely. mastering business. Whereas actually a lot of people who start business come from like the chaos <laughs> of creating and doing whatever else. So actually, I love this point about pairing and strengthening mm. people's leveraging on people's strengths and knowledge. So find the best person who does that. And they've got the knowledge and you extract the knowledge if you need to. Yeah, mm. don't assume that they can do that. Because if it's not their skill set, we, we never we always procrastinate about things that we really don't like to do or don't want to do. And so help them out with that. Yeah, but don't, yeah, as a business owner, don't think you've got to take over and do it all yourself because you're not empowering the team by doing that as well. You might think that you're just, oh, I just need to get it done, but that's not empowering the team in that way. Uh, so mm. we, I mentioned we have internal consultants that support with this as well. And actually a lot, a lot of the work is mainly just having the conversation and being like, that is the knowledge. I'm just going to write down what you've just said there. And do you want to send that video? It's there, but it, but actually it takes that other mind sometimes to, to extract. Amazing. Look, you, you warned me, Wendy, that this part, you said at the beginning of this part, this is a whole other really? webinar and it truly is. But just before we move on, yeah. I know we're going to talk about sharing the knowledge, but com completing on capturing, we've got some amazing concepts there of breaking that down, pairing up the thought, using mixed media, setting Ooh. up a plan, structure, it. How much is enough? When will we know that we've got enough good documentation? Or is this a uh, forever thing? Enough. I think you go back to those key responsibilities again. I think you can overdo things as well. That's mm. also a danger. If you just document everything, it's the business is still evolving. There's still going to be changes and it's just too much to keep up with that. So it's about, and not trying to capture every single scenario as well. Like sometimes like, how much detail do I need to put in a process? If you can get the result, like we're, we're not employing robots. It, people have got their own skills. Like we're employing someone. We're not bringing 16-year-olds off the street because they've never done anything this before. So you've also got people have got creativity. They can add to things. They, as time goes on, if they find something in a process, there's some scenarios. Like if this happens, we do this. You can add that in. So I think enough is about can these key responsibilities be carried out? Like the business isn't going to, going back to that risk, the business isn't going to collapse because that person's left. We've got the key things. And over time, that new person is going to develop into that role and they're going to take over that responsibility And as they learn. So here's another thing to write down. As a new person comes in, when they learn something new or that is, hasn't been documented yet, or they just add something in because they might add their own, they might come from another company that's done something similar and got but done it differently and it was more efficient, for example, then bring that skill in and then get that person to then help with that involvement of that process. Yeah. And that's one way to do it. So don't think you've got to capture 100% of everything. It's those key responsibilities that, that the business isn't going to, it's not going to affect the success of the business, okay? Because that can always be improved and empower that person to continue to, to document and update those things. So I think enough is having enough that the business can run. And if two or three people, even if you've got a bigger business, you might not even have one person leave. You might have two or three people leave at the same time. Yeah. Can you still manage? Yeah, of course, there's going to be a little bit of stress and a little bit of tidying up and things. No one's perfect, but you've got enough that the, a new person can come in 
-hmm. and they've got something to get started. So don't think you have to have all your ducks in a row before you can employ someone or get someone in there. You've got someone that's got to start. Maybe you've got five or six processes, whatever it is, to get them going, those key things that they need to do. And then all those other little things that come up, you can train them as you would normally and get them to document it. So enough, enough, or the answer to enough is basically relative to the sort of work we're doing, the sort of processes, the sort of people you're bringing on. So the point yeah. is, what do you need to achieve? What can people, what do mm. people understand and execute in order for the business to operate? And then what's, I guess it's, uh, as soon as you have knowledge or information that can share that then that's it i love you this point about you can have too much because sometimes that can almost stifle creativity and iteration yeah. if we're yes. accidentally creating tenants of how things are done but that's just because how they have been done rather than because that's truly best practice of mastering that activity whatever that may be Yes, it comes back to what are the core processes. So you could even map this out. So if somebody is in a role where there's a sales and marketing and then it goes to operations, or just map those key steps out and the things that they're doing repetitively. So the one-off things that happen that don't necessarily need to document if it's just a one-off or ad hoc thing. Uh -huh. But just remembering that when something new comes up, that it's like an automatic habit that, oh, I need to document that. And we all get busy in our jobs day to day. We're going to talk about that a bit later on, but how to maintain that. We're sort of going into that side of things. But yeah, in, enough is just having those core things that that person needs to do. And that's the part you need to document and keep going. Yeah. And you can add over time if you want to add more. The more that goes in, the more that people have to find. And also people can, I was training in the last couple of weeks myself, and Sometimes it's a simple, your playbook's gonna, not going to have the answer to everything, but things that do come up often, that's when, that's the key to go, oh, we should have that in there. Mm -hmm. It's just something like a, for example, a good one is software. People think they've got to write down every single thing that a software can do, where you can just go and Google it, or you can go to the help section of that software and find the information yourself. You don't have to have somebody spending hours and hours, weeks yeah. and weeks documenting something that is that's on the likely internet to change that's not within our control yes. as well right so that makes sense okay, so we've identified the knowledge we've empowered the team we've captured it we've started creating yep. structure it. what's next we share it cool <laughs> we need to make sure that other people can use it because if you go and put it into a you've done a lovely document or a video and you put it in a We've all done it. We put it in a folder somewhere and then a week later you go to find it and you don't know where you put it. You don't know what you named it. You can't share it with anyone. And then before we know it, we've got scattered things all over the place. And then we've got Sarah's got something on her hard drive. Someone else has got something in the cloud. Someone's using Dropbox. Someone's using Google. And then, you know what? They just make it up because they don't know which one. Even if they find a document, they don't know if it's up to date. They don't know who last did it. They don't know if it is the process. That's the mess that we get into. So we have to have one central place where all of this lives. Okay. So still documents you need to have, you need to link out to certain like forms and things that you need to fill out, but you need to have a central, whether you want to call it a playbook, an operations manual, a training manual, and everybody who needs what they need can access it easily, whether that's an app on their phone, if they're in the field or on a desktop, and they need to be able to find things quickly. And the people that need to edit things need to be able to edit them quickly as well. Because if you make it too hard for people, again, it's just, they won't do it. So key of that. So that's where Waybook comes in. So you need a platform. It has to be online. That's just a given these days because it's so easy to share. And if you've got it in one pl place, then you should know what that is the latest. That comes back to, again, the process owner being the one who needs to update that if there is a broken link or there is a new version or something that has to be in one central place because, again, that's nobody knows. So there, if there's one place to update everything, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, Love so this. that's how we share it. Yeah. We are by the very nature of what we do. This is so dear to my heart. And I think talk about there being knowledge in different places and different people having access. We really felt that pain as we were scaling our previous businesses, mainly because we were actually quite committed to Google Docs, to be honest with you. We were quite process driven. Mm -hmm. We had pretty, almost everything was on Docs, but we just had about five of everything towards the end of it. We had brand guidelines and then brand guidelines master and then brand guidelines updated 2020, like 2020. Yes. 2019 
And then you'd see it. And the other ones that would have like archive in the titles, all different versions. And then didn't quite know who had access to what. And actually, yes. even if they'd seen it, even if they did have access or where you search for it. And yeah. It... And then removing access for people is difficult as well, I find, yeah. in Google and all of that. So if you're going to use that system, and there's nothing wrong with that, especially when you're first starting out, because a lot of people don't have anything. Yeah, great if you've got something. But you have to be very organized with that. You have to set up the file structure. Mm really strategically from the beginning and you really should have just one person who's over that because if other people get their hands and put it in they can't find a folder so make a new one exactly like you said that's when it just becomes and it very quickly becomes chaotic so oh, yeah. if you're going to do that system you need to have someone in charge of that that is just making sure that yeah they keep an eye on it but people lose track of things like that because again it's not their key priority so yeah. you've got to make it someone's priority to do that i think this priority point actually taps into something i know i felt previously but before we obviously moved to waybook i would sometimes spend some time creating documents we established earlier it is important to do this but it's very rarely urgent. So if mm. I looked at my important versus urgent matrix and, and got documentation to where it needs to be and I completed it, if people didn't read it, review it, refer back to it, it's so demoralizing. Because it's almost, I've literally just spent a week doing this and I know no one's seeing it and I'm still getting asked these repetitive questions. And I think that's one of the, I think either having an incredible structure and awareness internally of that's where we go to for the knowledge or having mm. a tool that that kind of bring like way, but that brings that knowledge closer to the team almost mm -hmm. then addresses the other problem of we can see the value of this retained knowledge cycle into the business more quickly so we can see the reduction of those yeah. repetitive questions and the increased consistency of the work we're doing and of course the retention of the knowledge yes um, which then actually makes it more, more empowering it's more exciting yeah absolutely yeah it leads into that next part which is making it part of your dna really the business yeah so, so uh, and as <laughs> so, so I was going to say, I know this is a big part of what you do, right? So working with clients, the kind of establishing, finding this knowledge, creating the plan, capturing it, making sure it's in a place that we can share it. But yeah, what th this, I guess this is the fourth part of your section. You've mentioned there's four, four parts, M making it part of the DNA. What does that look like when it's done well? Yeah, it's about normalizing. It's like, this is the way we do things here. So it's not a surprise to everybody. It, and it can take a while to get to that. It's like anything that you're trying to introduce into your culture. So mm -hmm. one of the things is very, is that people will, if you've, especially as business owners do this, if you're always the one they come to and you're always answering their questions, they're going to continue to do that because you are the walking training manual, right? Sure. So difficult as it is, you need to then say, no, we have Waybook for that or we have our Hobbs manual for that. Call it something that it is something that they is part of your language of the business. And so they know to go to that. So as easy as you could just give them the answer there and then, make them go and find the information so that they know where it is. They can share it with other people. Again, it's just, it's a habit forming. So if you've got that information and also not just go and read it and look at it, if you don't understand it, say something, or if it's missing, that's the trigger to that. Oh, we need that in there then. And so that's the task. And I would say to that, if that's, person does that I, I would give that to that person's go that's uh, they might not come to you anymore because they're going to get more, more work but I would say that's a task go and put that in the task manager and I, if you could do that by the end of the week that'll be great yeah you know, that that's how you do it I mean it's looking for those gaps because you're going to have gaps as well but it's making it part of that's what we normally do and so after a while they'll stop coming to you with all those questions mm -hmm. they'll want to find it but that takes time to build that up because it, I guess if you've got established teams and that's the if, especially if they have been working in some sort of chaos, maybe is a bit strong word, but if they have been working in that sort of environment and now we're very streamlined and now we're, we're very process driven, that can take a while for those people. Whereas if you've got new people coming through, this mm -hmm. is just the way we do things. And they'll hopefully they'll go through your training, which is that's another thing that you're documenting. It's not just it's about saving that time on a new person coming on board and their understanding. So when you document, you're also documenting about your business and how to find people in the business and what they do. And there's all those things as well. So you've got all that benefit. You can capture so much of that in there. And it just saves so much time. It doesn't mean that you're not going to talk to that person or have a morning tea with them or introduce mm. them to the team. It just means that you can save all that. They come in and go, oh, yeah, I read about that. I understood that. Oh, yeah, you've got a team mascot. I read about all that in the, in the playbook, in the, yeah. in the manual. And, I yeah, it's just making that a normal thing. And 
And I can tell you the feedback, I just put a new team member through and she said, this is absolutely wonderful. I've learned so much. I feel like I've known you for years because it was all there. And that's where I find out where we've got any gaps. If there's something I've forgotten or I haven't updated, that person is coming to me rather than me doing that. And now I'm saying, oh yeah, that's a good point. We should put that in there. And that's their training. Go and <laughs> now go and write the process for that. Yeah, as you see, I get quite passionate about this side. No, but... I'm, 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 exa I'm exactly the same, Wendy. And I think that this point about we're not going to not speak to people, I think is a really core point. Mm. There is this tendency to believe, essentially what we're doing here is we're yeah these repetitive questions and we're reducing this kind of back and forth and inconsistency which actually is essential right in terms of making yeah. sure we can work cross time zone and work flexibly and remote and things yeah. like that as well as being efficient with the time the thing that really hits this home for me is you can still have exactly the same amount of conversation it's just talk about the things that drive the work forward rather than talking about the same thing that could otherwise be shared in another way and I think one way we've tried to yeah. manage is actually making sure that knowledge is as close to people as possible so yes you can yes. Search, but if you can also search through the browser plugins or one mm. change we made which made a really big difference is having a slack integration so if you ask me how do i book annual leave or how do i run payroll or and any of these points I can actually reply to you with a Waybook document so yes, I that's Waybook, right, yeah. that's payroll so this point of you saying make them go and find that information it's like if you share the information in no time into that document then you've got all of the efficiency you've still got that communication and one yeah. small thing and i promise this won't be a plug but i the team know i get incredibly excited when little features go in that make a big impact mm. they've just done a release where you can see what people are searching for and what results come up for that and the it's mm. such a simple thing but the mind-blowing value there is if as a knowledge owner within your business, if you're seeing search results in your waybook and there's zero documents being returned, it just basically gives you the core documents to then put into your plan. Ah, oh, somebody's asking how to, yeah. you know, what, what, how we manage our budgets on AdWords. And it's, we don't have anything about AdWords budgets. Yeah. Now. Let's just share that methodology or share that thought process. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as, as soon as we've achieved this normalizing that you're talking about, that this is the central point. This is actually what we contribute mm -hmm. to. It then becomes really self-fulfilling, multiplied on its own. Yeah, and that's amazing what you can do with technology these days. And so that's the automated part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, da the more data we can get, the more we can measure things and improve things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm the one getting overexcited now, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, maybe we just recap those things. So it's identify uh, who has the knowledge and what the knowledge is and who has it, document it or capture it, as we've been saying, sharing it and then normalizing it. That's the way we do things here. So that becomes part of your DNA and your culture. So they're the key steps. When normally the one that summarizes <laughs> these things, but when you're oh, sorry. somebody <laughs> who runs a business called organizing works and you are you spend all day every day structuring organizing systematizing i guess i can expect that you'll also come with your own summary right <laughs> i've saved you time that's what i do i save people time <laughs> yeah. i'm sure it's in the ops manual somewhere i could have just linked out to that yeah <laughs> um, yeah when, so when, i'm just looking at the time i was thinking oh, we've, you know, we, better know, sum, we, better, we better sum this up because we've talked for we so long for, and for, for much, i don't much know if l's um, got questions I, yeah, I know, I know we've had a few questions ping up that have then been answered as well. So I'm just going to invite people okay. to ask any questions if there's any remaining. But in the meantime, whilst those questions mm. are coming in, do you have any, and you've shared so many amazing top tips, yeah. do you have any kind of standout top tips of if you've got maybe a founder, an ops manager, somebody who's been tasked to create this single source of truth or to really manage this knowledge retention, what are the kind of standout things in their mind that they should be thinking about? Well, yeah, we've touched on this. So that plan, have a plan in place, be ready for when the team question things and, and want to know more. So have a communication plan about that. Be really clear on why you're doing this as a business, like anything. Why is it important to the business? What, are, what risks have you identified? So explain that, explain the benefits to the team so that you've got them on your side because 
the more they can do, the less it then falls on the leadership team and the business manager. So really having that open conversation. So if you've got, especially if you've got a bigger business where you've got a lot of people, then if you don't communicate, they're going to make up their own mind about why are we doing this? What's it? Yeah, we've managed so far. So if, if you've got any of that in your business, otherwise I have, I've worked with businesses that are like, yeah, God, we need this so much. We're desperate for this. But then if on the other hand, it all depends. So just being really clear and getting everyone behind it because you do need everyone aligned to really make this work so that would be probably if somebody was taking on this internally in their business that would be the main thing is to communicate have that plan so that when preempt what questions you're going to get give them all the help that you can give them so again they're not going I just don't know what to do give them the capacity in their workload as well to get this work done at least to get the bulk of it done and then it's just a matter of maintaining it and so giving them the clear picture of what this means to the business and to them and to their customers and their suppliers and whoever else that impacts. So that's the main thing. Have that goal in mind and have a plan so that it doesn't just become, oh, we've got really busy because we've got this new project come in. And then all of a sudden this now takes a back step. It's got to be made a priority. So you have to have somebody driving that. Mm -hmm. So get as many team members on board. I've worked with bigger companies where I found that they've got a few advocates. So people that are, look for the people in the business as well that can help as far as they're really good at maybe the editing side or they're really, really attention to detail, or maybe they've written procedures before in other businesses. So it's quite natural for them. So look for those people that can also help that, and get some of those wins, get some teams involved and start to, so they can start to see the benefit because it could be like a long time otherwise until, oh, we're doing all this, but and it might be, go it's going into Waybook, but we don't really know nothing's happening with it. So Again, maybe just one idea is there's maybe build out one section of it and start to use that. But again, this is the whole thing about some people think they've got to wait until they've got everything done. And then they might, oh, we might be ready to launch soon, but then they're already 50% of it, maybe not that much, is out of date. Let's work to a plan, get something, get them using it. Don't go and buy a software to a tool like Waybook and then sit on it. Start to use it, even if it's just in one department. Yeah. So I suppose if you're going to sum that up, is take action start but start with a plan <laughs> yeah i love this this makes a lot of sense when we've got a few questions come in but that i believe they have yeah. I, they have been answered as we go so i actually think okay. we can just go to a, a you know that if you it's the beginning of my day wendy so i could carry on speaking all day but i know it's <laughs> even with you so i think on that note we will definitely bring this to a close and um, I've got so much from this, lots of insight and also lots of excitement because I feel like your clarity of thought on this and the real practical, actionable things that we can do to really protect ourselves from knowledge loss. But also, it's not just about that, is it? This has become very right. clear that actually in the process of protecting ourselves from knowledge loss, we're also mm. amplifying and creating value for so much of the business. I love this. And whole an asset. Yeah, it's so true, actually. We see a lot of people that are saying, I want to sell my business now. How can I make this saleable? How can I make this scalable? So I think that actually, it's not just about retaining knowledge. It's about setting people up for success and, and creating this for the business. I love this point about the 80-20 rule when it comes to knowledge as well. So actually, we don't have to have everything completed. As soon as we've got mm -hmm. something that then alleviate some repetitive pressure or some sort of concepts of knowledge that lives elsewhere then it essentially has the value immediately and that may just be one or two or three things from each individual person and then finally bringing this culturally in there so a lot of people I know when start this sort of creation of a playbook they'll start with the policies or they'll start with the welcome documents and that's valuable but that doesn't necessarily bring value to the whole team in order for them to see mm the value of having centralized knowledge so i think actually mm. prioritizing people to create the value that they will get the benefit from immediately perhaps a repetitive yes. process they do that saves them time then almost like yes. buys that time and attention to be like i am in i'm all in let's get yes. everything else done. yeah yeah for sure yeah. Wendy, I've personally had an amazing time. Thank you so much. I'm sure there's many people watching this that will want more of your knowledge and insights. How can people get in touch with you? How can people work with you? What's the best way? Yeah, the best way is to go on my website. So it's Organizing Works. That's organizing with an S and works, W-O-R-K-S dot com dot A-U. I mean, don't forget the AU from in Australia. Otherwise, LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn, Wendy Tadakoro. But yeah, over to the website. There's a few resources on there. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. We will put all of Wendy's links in the show notes and a few other things that we've picked up and discussed on this. 
But for today's session, once again, I'd like to thank Wendy so much for all of your time and also the Wavert team in the background supporting on this call. Thank you to you for joining us. I hope that's enabled you to get some additional insight and inspiration on how we can take the time, effort and attention to centralise our knowledge, create this single source of truth to prevent us from knowledge loss in the future, but more importantly, to create this value and asset that helps us scale our businesses and also run our businesses more enjoyably as well. Find and refine that clarity in what sometimes can become the chaos of growing our businesses. And of course, enjoy some smooth scaling. So Wendy, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone else. And we look forward to seeing you all on the next session. Have a great one. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye now.